today about the stroke. So what are our main thing to discuss in stroke is how a pathologist view stroke. So what will be our learning objective? So by the end of this lecture, we'll be able to know what is the definition of stroke? What is its epidemiology? Then <coughs> what happens actually in the blood vessel? Because the basic pathogenetic mechanism for the development of a stroke is majority of the time is an abnormality in a blood vessel. Okay? So what happens to a blood vessel or basic pathogenetic mechanism in a blood vessel? Then along when we are going to read about the pathogenesis, definitely we are going to see the risk factors, like uh, who is at the highest risk of development of the stroke and who has the least risk to develop the stroke. Then we are going to talk about different types of stroke. Like to for you to know, there are two major types like ischemic and hemorrhagic. And a brief about their pathophysiology, then how like the tissue, neuronal tissue reacts to the stroke. What are the early changes? What are the late changes you see? And what are the consequences of these changes as a form of sign and symptoms a patient can show? Then as we are learning about the stroke, so we must know about the repair mechanism. You know, when we talk about the pathogenesis, in pathogenesis comes about the etiology, the morphology, the complications, and how a tissue is going to react to that injury, whether they will go into the permanent cell de death or it will try to repair or and to get the function what it was before working. So we'll know about a bit, a bit about the repair mechanism because the repair mechanism of the CNS is still in a very preliminary stage. We still don't know about in detail about the repair mechanism of the central nervous system. So we'll just see what is the basic features of the repair mechanism, okay? So now we go for the definition. What do you call about stroke? Like it is sudden because as you see in your medic your case, trigger case analysis or throughout the case, it has been termed as a medical emergency. So it is sudden onset of acute focal. Most of the time it is focal, okay? It is due to the area involved, okay? But rarely it can be global where the entire CNS or entire brain parenchyma is involved. And this is usually seen in the hypoxia. Okay. And there is neurological deficit. What do you mean by neurological deficit? Sensory and motor deficit. Patient will have either one hand involvement, one limb involvement, or half side of the body, along with the some sensory function like loss of light touch, lot of loss of coordination. Then there are certain higher functions like loss of memory, aphasia. His, his speech is affected depending upon the area is involved. And wh what is the basic pathological or pathological mechanism behind this stroke is some changes in the blood vessel. Okay. So why the blood vessel is or blood supply is very important to the brain. You know, like the total weight of the brain is just around 1 to 2% of the body weight. If suppose one is 60 kgs, its brain is around 6 to 8 or 6 to 10 kgs, okay? But it receives almost 15% of the resting cardiac output. See, 1% of the weight and look at the amount of blood it receives or it requires 15%. And look at the amount of the oxygen. 20% of the total body oxygen consumption is done by CNS. Okay. So it's very important to know even a small or something little bit change in the oxygen supply to the brain, there are high chances of the neuronal tissue going into the necrotic process or even some little bit change in the blood flow also will lead to like severe changes, sometime development of the stroke. Okay. And you know, like uh, 
there is like the blow the blood flow sometimes you know like when we eat the blood flow to the stomach increases or sometimes like we run the blood flow to the skin and the lung increases but it doesn't happen with the central nervous system central nervous system the blood flow remain constant okay and it is the clinical terminology we call as a stroke when a patient admitted to the clinical side or in general layman language we call stroke but in a more precise way we call it as a cerebrovascular accident and sometimes some european country it call is as a cerebrovascular episode so stroke cva or cve all are the one and the same entity and always it is an emergency and symptoms become very very acutely so how does it happen cerebrovascular accident it is due to or principally due to the ischemia to a part of the brain or hemorrhage you know you see like okay hemorrhage is there why there is ischemia high blood is going to the brain because there is hemorrhage but you know what hemorrhage is hemorrhage is the blood is not going to the its target organ or target place due to the rupture of the blood vessel somewhere the blood is getting extra vicissitude from the blood vessel to the cns parenchyma so ultimately it is leading to the ischemia of the target organ or target area that is supplied by that injured blood vessels okay and what is the final event it lead to the death of the neuron okay or death of the brain cells okay so epidemiology so you know like annually 750000 person get affected with the stroke it's a big number okay and in saudi arabia the incidence has increased drastically if you go back to the like in the 90s the affected people were just around in the range of 4 to 5 per 100000 per year but now it is the like this estimate is not correct like not current one it is like some 2015 one we find 29 out of 100000 okay so if you see if you like this is a big number getting affected with the stroke okay and in general population throughout the globe you find it is around 2.5% like in 100 person 2.5 have the chances of development of the stroke and it is the third most common cause of death okay what are the first and second most common cause of death lung cancer Yeah, among the cancer, the lung cancer is the this thing. Yeah, we have the road traffic accidents, cardiovascular, like like uh, MI, and the third one is the stroke. Okay, and you see, like the number is very high. If someone has got stroke, you see, the twenty five percent of them can die within one year, and most of the time, within one month, majority of the patient will not survive. Okay. and it is the stroke is the number one leading cause of the disability 50 to 75% will be like they will be functionally independent okay but 25% of the person who has suffered stroke will live with permanent disability and what kind of disability it could be in the physical disability cognitive psychological and the financial impact due to the chronic disability he is not able to work he is not able to walk he will be emotionally fragile as you have seen our patient he has developed generalized anxiety disorder some person can develop depression some person can develop bipolar disorder so different spectrum of psychological disorder can be seen as a complication of the stroke now we go to the risk factors okay so we have certain non modifiable and the modifiable risk factor what do you mean by non modifiable this risk factor cannot be modified okay age we cannot reduce our age if i am going to be next year 43 so i cannot become 42 okay so age is cannot be reduced so thus who is more than 55 years of the age there is like sorry like each decades like if suppose 50 to 60 there is like 
double the incidence like suppose 55 to 65 suppose there is a chances of 10 percent 65 to 75 it become 20 percent and so on okay uh gender it is equal for men and women but somehow due to some reason we don't know clearly about but women die more frequently due to stroke than the men okay race race is can also be not if i am born Asian, I will remain always Asian. I cannot change my race to American or African. So it's more common in the African Americans, Hispanics, Native American, Asian Americans. So these people have the higher incidence in the United States. Okay. Hereditary. If suppose you have a family history of stroke, definitely you have a high chances of development of the stroke. Same goes with the past history of transient ischemic attack or prior stroke, prior history of the stroke. Because once you have developed transient ischemic attack or stroke, you cannot erase it from your medical record. It will always be there. So it becomes non-modifiable risk factor. Okay. Now we go to the modifiable. Like modifiable risk factor, we can modify with the help of lifestyle changes or medical treatment. So high blood pressure, you maintain your blood pressure with the medication and the lifestyle change, you can reduce the risk of stroke. Smoking, you quit smoking, the incidence or risk will come down. High blood cholesterol, reduce your cholesterol level. Heart diseases, if you have heart diseases, you take care of your heart disease, take proper medication, it will get reduced. Oral contraceptive use, stop use of the oral contraceptive, the risk will decrease. A sickle cell disease, okay. In the sickle cell disease, I actually it is should be a non-modifiable risk factor because in the sickle cell disease, you have like this is the family or genetic disease. But if you know you are sickle cell disease and you avoid certain changes, certain condition which lead to sickling. So you can reduce the risk of, okay. Suppose you know you are sickle cell patient, you should not go to the high temperature, you should not go to the very cold temperature, you should not have the rigorous exercise. If you avoid this, you can reduce the risk of development of this thing. Hypercoagulability, you take proper treatment to maintain your coagulation profile normal. You can see diabetes if you make sure like your um, blood glucose is maintained like this thing. Like some people say TIA, transient ischemic attack on the aspirin is a modified risk factor. But I have made it very clear if some patient have past history of TIA, it is non-modifiable risk factor. Okay. So this is just I have added over here because it is in the references. But TIA, if once have a TIA, one person has TIA, it become non-modifiable risk factor. Okay, atrial fibrillation, physical inactivity, obesity, all these are the non-modifiable risk factors. So you see, like ninety percent of the stroke risk could be attributed to the modifiable risk factor. The non-modifiable risk factor just for the 10%, but approximately 90% due to the high BP, hyperdiabetes, obesity, hyperlipidemia, and the renal dysfunction just usually lead to the hypercoagulable stages. So these are the modifiable risk factor, which is responsible for the 90% type of the risk factor developing into the stroke. And they say like 74% due to the, some behavioral risk factor like smoking, not having good physical activity like sedentary lifestyle, always on the bed, not moving around, like not taking good healthy diet, a lot of junk food, a lot of high fat, high trans fat diet. Okay. And sometimes they have now the recent study have found like air pollution also increases the risk of a stroke up to 29%. Okay. So these are the risk factor. Now I share here with the list of the risk factor and you see these are the values. OK, if someone blood pressure is more than 140 and 90 and they do or the one who don't know his blood pressure, he is the high risk. If the blood pressure in a range of pre hypertensive range, you need to caution that person. If the blood pressure in the normal range, there is a low risk. OK, cholesterol more than 240. Definitely, or the person say, I don't know my cholesterol. 
it is a high risk. 200 to 239, caution, less than 200. Diabetes, if you have diabetes, high risk factor. Borderline or pre-diabetic, medial or you need to caution. As low diabetes, like low risk and so on. So if you have three or more index in the red, okay, you are overweight, you smoke and your blood cholesterol is more than 250. Even you don't have diabetes, you don't have hypertension, but you have a very high score or high risk of development of the uh, stroke and you must ask your family physician to suggest you the preventive way. If you are into the yellow zone, four to six score of the yellow zone, you are in a period in a subgroup where you can come back to the green very easily with little bit activities or little bit modification in your diet and lifestyle. But always try not to shift from this yellow to the red. And is the green, always try to remain in the green zone. Okay, So these are the risk factors. For you, it's very important to know the non-modifiable and modifiable risk factor. Again, I'm telling TIA, if a person says he has the previous history of TIA, it means it is a non-modifiable risk factor. Now, what is the basic pathophysiology or basic pathological event in the blood vessel? What happened in the blood vessel? So we see the main culprit for the development of the stroke is atherosclerosis. Okay. And atherosclerosis, you know very well, you have read in the CRF uh, course, very good, very detailed about the atherosclerosis. So you know the atherosclerosis is a lesion of the intimal layer of the blood vessel, okay? And this is characterized by the formation of atheroma. And this atheroma has nothing but the proliferation of the smooth muscle cells. Then you have the endothelial cell proliferation and the collection of the cholesterol inside this, okay? And this protrude into the lumen, okay? And it can cause, sometimes it can get complicated. This endothelial get rupture and it will lead to formation of the thrombosis. Sometimes it will partially occlude the blood vessel. Sometimes it is completely block the blood vessel leading to the ischemia of the affected area. So, and sometimes this plaque also lead to the, this is the, uh, like to some extent, the basic pathogenetic mechanism for the ischemic stroke, okay? Same atherosclerosis can also lead to the weakening of the muscle wall. And if a person with the atherosclerosis have hypertension also, that will lead to the formation of aneurysm. And these aneurysm can easily rupture and bleed. And this will a basic pathogenic mechanism for the thrombotic, or oh, sorry, hemorrhagic stroke, okay? So far, I am clear to you. Yes, 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 doctor. Okay, you have any doubt, you can stop and you can ask. Okay, so, so far, our lecture is clear to you and you are in the groove. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we go for the another pathophysiology. As we have no, there is the atherosclerosis, atheroma, and which will lead to the formation of the thrombos okay so first thing what happened there is a high hypercholesterolemia that will lead to the filtration of the lipid in the intimal layer then that will keep on progressing there are certain hypotheses like smooth muscle proliferation endothelial proliferation endothelial injury this will lead to the development of the plaque and this development of the plaque will also alter the blood flow so blood flow turbulence will altered so it will lead to the uh, blood will become hypercoagulable. Okay, there is high chances of the blood stay for a longer time in the affected area, and it will increases the hypercoagulability of the blood. So abnormal wall, hypercoagulable blood vessel, or uh, turbulence to the blood flow, and this will lead to the formation of the thrombus. Once the thrombus is formed. It will lead to the complete obliteration or if sometime the thrombus is formed remote, sometimes thrombus can be formed into the common carotid artery or into the internal carotid artery. From there, there will be a small part of this thrombus 
which will be known as the thromboembolism it will go and get large you know smaller artery like the middle cerebral artery or the anterior cerebral artery and it will block that artery and the area supplied by that artery will go will undergo ischemic changes okay and the person will have the manifestation of depending upon the artery and the area involved okay you know for you when you read the anatomy of the blood supply of the brain and what area supplied by these blood vessel it is very very important to know what blood vessel is affected and what area is involved and what symptoms can be seen previously when they don't have the ct they don't have the mri they don't have the angiography the physician of the previous time can with the help of sign and symptoms alone in the patients can have exact location of which artery is involved and which area is affected they were so perfect nowadays alhamdulillah alhamdulillah we have like lot of uh, investigation available to us and we can with the help of investigation we can know where which area is involved and if suppose there is a thrombus there is a embolism over there we can reach the artery and we can block the or uh, we can break the embolism and we can re canalize the artery and re regain the circulation okay but at that time they were they can at least know which artery is involved just with the help of sign and symptoms okay now to what happen when there is a ischemia this ischemia produces hypoxic damage okay and you know the neurons are highly vulnerable to the hypoxia even a small period like 30 second interruption of the oxygen supply to the neuron their metabolism is altered and if the blood supply is not restored and it continues for 2 minutes the metabolism stops and if it is even continue for up to 5 minutes it results into the cell death so see that's why the fast is important okay you know the fastest and the last t is for the time whenever you see the sign and symptoms of a stroke in a patient don't waste the time okay rush immediately so that you can at least preserve some of the functions of the brain and prevent the disabilities okay so what happen why when there is a blood supply either reduced or absent it will lead to the either oligemia or ischemia but sometime what happen the blood supply is normal but there is hypoxia like a, in cases of covid in cases of like cardiac arrest in cases of high altitude okay there is so less oxygen tension so you will get the hypoxic type of stroke okay now what kind of damage seen pathologically when a pers when a neuron is subjected to hypoxia and what kind of chain you can see so you have two type of things initially you see the reversible changes okay you see the micro vacuolation and the eosinophilic cytoplasm known as the red neurons these red neurons are the early changes seen less than 24 hours and if you like what if you can revert back to the blood supply these changes are reversible but the blood supply is stopped for a longer period of time you will see the nucleus has become small there is pycnosis there is karyorexis there is development of the necrosis and when these changes come the cha the changes are irreversible even if you restore the blood supply also what is lost it will lost okay so we have the ischemic cascade okay so what happen whenever there is a ischemia the metabolic events get affected ischemia lead to the inadequate atp production there is loss of iron homeostasis like loss of balance between sodium potassium and calcium okay there is release of excited free amino acid like glutamate there is formation of the free radicals and all collectively lead to the sealed cell death there is a border zone okay all this thing is going immediately in the area which is affected by the ischemia but there is a border zone the area surrounding 
the this area if the blood supply is restored this border zone area can reverse back to the complete normal stage and this will prevent further loss of neurological functions so arterial occlusion will first have what happened over there ischemia energy failure influx of the calcium and sodium but most importantly the calcium there is proteolysis breakdown of the cell protein break, breakdown of the cell membrane and which will eventually lead to the cell death also energy failure will lead to the mitochondrial damage that will lead to the program cell death apoptosis okay there is along with inflammation ischemia this along this pathway there is also an inflammatory pathway goes on okay so there is wbc infiltration this wbc will release the cytokine this cytokine will lead to the formation of free radicals that will lead to the cell death if sometime this reperfusion is most of the time very helpful okay but at time this reperfusion brings a very large number of wbc this large number of wbc will cause lot of release of cytokines and there is lot of free radical formation and that will instead of helping will lead to the cell death this is called reperfusion injury so it is very important for you when you are doing the reperfusion to follow up the patient in the icu to look for the whether your patient is improving or your patient is deteriorating if the your preparation is deteriorating you see there is a reperfusion injury and these reperfusion injury is mainly due to the release of cytokines from the wbc which has come with the restoration of the blood supply clear yes clear so this is like little bit more detail when there is a mitochondrial damage there is loss of atp so there is once the atp is lost multiple functions will be lost okay there is again formation of reactive oxy oxygen species this is nothing but the free radicals which is not good for the cell that will lead to the damage to the lipids protein and dna of a cell okay as i told you calcium entry is very very important okay whenever there is a ischemia there is influx of excessive calcium ion okay so these excessive calcium ion will lead to the increased mitochondrial permeability or damage to the mitochondrial membrane and activation of the multiple cellular enzyme this cellular enzyme can be nucleases proteases atpases this will lead to the damage of the atp membrane phospholipids will damage the membrane nucleases will damage the nucleus and so on okay and there is a membrane damage plasma membrane and the lysosomal membrane damage then there is dna damage okay these are all the mechanism of the this thing and what is the main mechanism depletion depletion of atp influx of the calcium free radicals reactive oxygen species and this will all lead to the defect in the membrane permeability and eventually lead to the rupture of the lysosomal nuclear and cell membrane as we were disc discussing about the reperfusion injury okay so you know you found there is a ischemia okay and you found with the angiography there is a block in the in uh, middle cerebral artery branch of the internal carotid artery so you try to do the thrombolytic treatment okay so and with this you will try to restore the blood flow to the area of the brain which is previously affected by the ischemia by a thrombosis or an embolism okay so this will either by the lysis of the clot or will do the dislodgement of the clot okay so what happen once this clot clot is removed the blockage is removed there is gush of blood to the affected area this gush excessive blood supply coming to the affected area bringing the cells especially the wbcs and excessive amount of the oxygen okay 
So these cells, WBC will produce the cytokines and these cytokines will form the reactive oxygen species and that will lead to the cell damage. So reperfusion injury is very common, okay? So once you have a patient of the ischemic stroke or myocardial infarction, if you are doing the thrombolytic therapy, you need to monitor closely your patient in the ICU until he shows any signs of these reperfusion injuries, okay? Now we the type or the classification of the stroke, okay? We have ischemic stroke. It is the most common one. 85% type of the stroke are the ischemic. Ischemic stroke can be divided into the embolism. This embolism coming from somewhere, either from the heart, from the aorta, or from the external or common carotid artery. Thrombotic, it is the thrombosis of the affected blood vessel itself, okay? Then we have the less 15% are the hemorrhagic stroke. The hemorrhage can happen inside the brain parenchyma. We call it the intracerebral hemorrhage or it can happen into the subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? Or uh, subarachnoid space, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So ischemic stroke, okay? So what happened in the ischemic stroke? You know, there is ischemia due to the blockade of the artery, which will lead to the in inadequate or reduced blood flow to the brain due to either partial or complete occlusion of an artery. This is the most common one, 85% of the all stroke. And it's how you will find the your stroke is the massive stroke or the minimal stroke. You see the rapidity of onset, size of the lesion, and if there is collateral circulation is there or not. If there are collateral circulation, the effect will not be that much severe but if there is no collateral circulation a big clot obstructing the complete lumen of a principal artery you will find the very rapid onset and a very severe type of the stroke and symptom progress from 24 to 72 hours as you see the development of the infarction and edema in the brain parenchyma Ischemic is further subdivided into the embolic and the thrombic stroke, okay? So embolus, embolus come from somewhere remote artery and lodge and occludes a cerebral artery. So once the artery is blocked, it will lead to the infarction and edema. It is embolic. As you know, the ischemic stroke is the most common. And in this ischemic stroke, embolic is the most common. So most common type of stroke is the embolic stroke, okay? From where emboli comes, either from the endocardial rail of the heart. Usually it is seen in the cases of atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, infective endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, and someone who is in the artificial valves. Or sometimes this emboli dislodge from the atheromatous plaque or thrombotic atheromatous plaque of a larger artery and go and block a small artery. Symptoms are very rapid occurrence in this case. It can affect any age group, okay? And recurrence is also very common if underlying cause is not treated. If you know there is thrombosis or like you have the thromboembolism in a carotid artery. As we see in our patient, he has undergone carotid end arterectomy, okay? If you do that procedure, you reduces the chance of development of embolism. If you don't do that procedure, you have the patient will again can develop these things, okay? So recurrence is common if underlying cause is not treated, okay? Thrombotic stroke, it happened when the lumen of a blood vessel get blocked by a thrombus, okay? It is usually seen with the hypertension and diabetes mellitus and it is due to the atherosclerosis of the affected artery. It is the second most common type of the stroke. And usually in these patients, you will find transient ischemic attack because sometimes, you know, the there is formation of like a plaque. And if there is some arterial spasm, it will lead to the blockade and there will be a sign and symptoms of the stroke, but that will not last for more than 24 hours. Okay. 
There is another type of the lacunar stroke. It is usually seen in the hypertensive patient. And this is like, uh, suppose if it is involving the larger brain tissue, you will find the motor hemiplegia, contralateral loss of sensation and motor ability. So where do you see the atherosclerosis of the blood vessel in the central nervous system? So most common in the internal carotid artery and in the internal carotid artery, most common in the middle cerebral artery. In the corticospinal pathway, you will see in the internal capsule, okay? So arteries of the internal capsule, okay? That's why internal capsule blood supply and the anatomy of the internal capsule was an important agenda for this case. Sometimes you will find the multiple microinfarcts and these multiple microinfarcts usually due to hypertension or due to the age-related changes. So you have your different arteries like anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, superior division, middle cerebral artery, inferior division, middle cerebral artery, deep division, posterior cerebral artery, anterior choroidal artery, posterior cerebral artery, deep branches, different area affected and different arteries, okay? So what ischemia or thrombosis will eventually lead to the infarction of the area affected by that artery, okay? So it could most commonly affect internal capsule. If the internal capsule is affected because crossing occurs over there, so you will find the contralateral hemiparesis. Small infarcts you can see in the patient with the hypertension or the age-related changes. Uh, Sometimes you will find the multiple infarcts, which is commonly seen in the patients with the dementia or the Alzheimer's disease. So what is the gross morphological features in a stroke? Here you see by the time interval, okay? Usually there is no gross changes in the brain parenchyma if you examine the brain immediately or within six hours of the irreversible injury, okay? But by 24 to 48 hours, you know the brain tissue or affected tissue become pale, soft, swollen, and you will not be able to differentiate between the gray and white matter, okay? If it is become old from two to 10 days, the brain parenchyma undergo the liquefactive necrosis it will become gelatinous and friable, okay? And there is like ill-defined body between the normal and infarcted tissues. From 10 days to three weeks, you know, all the tissue liquefies. It will just leave a fluid-filled cavity surrounded by the thick glial wall. So you have, after 24 hours, soft and swollen brain parenchyma, loss of definition between gray and white matter, and edema, either complete cerebral edema or edema of the affected area. After four days, you will find the type of necrosis in the brain, which is known as the liquefactive necrosis. Histological changes, uh, first 12 hours, you will find, you will see the eosinophilic changes in the cytoplasm of the neurons, okay? Or red neuron or vacuolation around the cytoplasm. 24 hours, these are the reversible changes. Once the necrosis sets in 24 hours, you will find usually a coagulative necrosis in early time. But as the time progresses, after 24 hours, you will find the liquefactive necrosis. The liquefactive necrosis is the very characteristic necrosis which is seen in the... If you have a question asked to you, which is the commonest type of necrosis seen in the brain? If you have option coagulate you, uh, caseous fat, and the liquefactive or fibrinoid necrosis, your answer should always be the liquefactive necrosis. Liquefactive necrosis is nothing but a type of coagulative necrosis. Even though you have these two options, your option will always be liquefactive necrosis. You cannot ask for it like both the necrosis are present, both the answers are correct. No, coagulative necrosis can be seen in any organ like kidney, heart, spleen, liver, okay? But liquefactive necrosis is very, very specific for the brain, okay?
Then after seven days, you see the infiltration of the microglia. And these microglia are nothing but the CNS macrophages. And they will do the breakdown of the lipid. They will lead to the formation of the granulation tissues. Then reactive astrocyte proliferation. There is formation of the capillary bed. So you will find after one or three months, you will find the affected area is converted into a cystic space which is surrounded by the thick layer of the glial tissue. Okay, so these are the histological changes you will see. You will find this cellular edema. Okay, there is granulation tissue, the infiltration of the microglia or macrophages, and you have the cystic space which is surrounded by the thick glial tissue. This is a cyst and this is the thick glial tissues which is formed mainly by the proliferating capillaries and astrocytes. Now we go to the hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke is less common than the ischemic stroke. They are 15% of the all stroke. They result either from the intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, So intracerebral hemorrhage is commonly seen in the hypertensive patient. And 80% of the time, this type of infarction due to hypertension seen in the basal ganglia, brain stem, then cerebrum, then cerebral cortex. Okay, This is in the descending order, most common in the basal ganglia, least commonly in the cerebral cortex. Okay, Pathogenesis is not fully understood, but it is mainly due to the due to chronic hypertension. There are formation of the micro aneurysm in the blood vessel wall, the blood vessel wall has become weak. And if the person is not maintaining his blood pressure, not controlling it, blood pressure, slight jump in the blood pressure due to any stressful condition can lead to the rupture of any aneurysmatic blood vessel. And that will lead to the formation of the infarct. Okay. And you see the mortality is very, very high in hemorrhagic space, especially the intracerebral hemorrhage more than 80% die and if someone survive he will have to live with the severe neurological deficit okay so intracerebral hemorrhage due to rupture of a vessel hypertension is the most important cause the other causes could be the mas vascular malformation like arteriovenous malformation vasculitis congenital disorder trauma okay there is sudden onset of the symptom then severe progression of the neurological deficit, headache, nausea, vomiting, loss of consciousness, prognosis is poor, more than like 50% die within weeks and total mortality is around 80%. And if someone survives, they will be functionally independent. Then subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is due to the bleeding into the subarachnoid spaces. Okay. And what is the most common cause for the subarachnoid species? It can be congenital due to rupture of a congenital anomaly, which is known as the berry aneurysm. Berry aneurysm in the uh, circle of villus. If this is a congenital anomaly, and sometimes if this person suffer hypertension or minimal trauma also, this berry aneurysm can get ruptured, and this will lead to the formation of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Or sometimes it is acquired due to the atherosclerosis. Okay. Other causes could be arteriovascular malformation, trauma, illicit drug abuse, especially the cocaine and heroin. Its incidence is less, 6 to 16 per 100,000. And incidence increases with the age, more common in the women. And the your patient have one very characteristic symptom if he develops subarachnoid hemorrhage is the worst headache of his life. If you have a patient coming to e, ER or a and &E, and he say, doctor, I have severe headache and this is the worst kind of headache. I have never suffered this type of headache. Always suspect the subarachnoid hemorrhage in that case. Okay. So this is a very important glitching point. If a person come with the headache and he say it's the worst headache of his life. Okay. So these berry aneurysm are usually seen in the 1 to 2 percent of the general population and more common in the elderly. And if the person have hypertension, he might have multiple aneurysm. And 
atheroma also can occur in this berry aneurysm. This aneurysm, the small berry-like aneurysm in the circle of fullness. Even minimal trauma or minimal change in the blood pressure can lead to rupture of this berry aneurysm and this can lead to the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Complication and prognosis of the hemorrhagic stir. Usually it is very fatal. 15% of the patient die instantly. Maybe sometimes there may be re-bleeding if you don't know the exact cause. If there is multiple berry aneurysm or there is arterial malformation that can undergo re-bleeding and there is subarachnoid hemorrhage. And as I told you previously also, there is the acute onset of severe headache. Acute onset of severe worst type of headache of a patient's life. And so it is also associated with the neurological deficit. And you know, one third, like around 33% of the person will survive. If they survive, they will have the permanent disability. As we are seeing, the hypertension is the one of the most important cause for the stroke. So you must know what hap what does hypertension causes to the brain. Uh, also, the hypertension is known as the silent killer. A person who is suffering from hypertension, he doesn't know his hypertension, and suddenly one fine day he land up in the A and E with hemiparesis, brain hemorrhage, or bleeding from or bleeding in the cerebral parenchyma. Okay. So what happens with the hypertension? Hypertension is a, one of the important risk factor for the atherosclerosis. If the, someone has already atherosclerosis, he develops hypertension. The process of the atherosclerosis is accelerated. Okay, It will also lead to the necrosis of the vessel wall, fibrinoid necrosis, thickening and hyalinization of the wall. Though it makes the wall thicken, but this is the abnormal thickening, which will lead eventually will lead to the weakness of the wall strength and formation of the aneurysm, which can easily get ruptured. Hypertension also affects the deep penetrating arteries and arterioles that supply the basal ganglia, hemisphere with white matter and brainstem. So it will also cause arterial sclerosis, hyperplastic arteritis, then you have uh, necrosis, all these things are the feature of the hypertension. And what it leads to? It leads to formation of the single or multiple small fluid fit cavity, which look like a crescent moon, halal. So it's called lacunar infarct or lacunar cyst. So this is about the lacunar infarct can be seen in the putamen, globus pallidus, lenticular, lenticular nucleus, thalamus, internal capsule, deep white matter, caudate nucleus, and pons in the descending order. So most commonly it is seen in the basal ganglia, least commonly in the pons. But pons is the common site affect, get affected with the hypertension. Okay, But if the hypertension affecting in the brain parenchyma, most commonly area involved is the globus pallidate, putamen, lenticular nuclei, a part of basal ganglia. Now we go to the repair. How repair occurs in the CNS, okay? You know, you have little bit read in the life cycle about the repair, healing and repair. So you have the three types of cell, which one is the labile cell, which is continuously divided and which can regenerate itself whenever there is an injury. Okay. Another one of the stable cell, like the liver, they remain quiescent, but whenever there is an injury to the affected organ, they will undergo series of changes, hyperplasia and hypertrophy, and they can multiply and can get the normal function of the affected organ. There are another set of the cells, which is permanent cells, which comes CNS and the cardiac muscle cell. If these cells get injured, they cannot regenerate. Always they will heal by the fibrosis. And the fibrosis is not the neuron. So obviously their function will get affected. So once the neurons are damaged, they will replace by the fibrosis and there is permanent loss of the function. But they have seen from the ages, a person who suffered stroke, sometimes he shows the complete recovery. Okay. So they see like what there is like some kind of neurogenesis. 
which or sometime patient have show the partial recovery so this led scientists to think there is the neuron though they are permanent cell but after an injury there is some kind of neurogenesis that's why a person is able to regain the functions okay so whenever there is a ischemia this ischemia always bring inflammation and this inflammation will lead to the activation of the glial tissue this inflammation will bring the inflammatory cytokine tnl alpha il1 il6 nitrous oxide and other cytokines which will lead to the activation of the neuronal cells sometime this inflammation will bring different type of the cytokines like insulin like growth factor one neuronal growth factor and other growth factors these growth factors will be responsible for the neurogenesis and in term regeneration but when there is ischemic injury there is neuronal death which will lead to the loss of function but if there is neurogenesis this will lead to the regeneration so nowadays we are focusing more on the ways of therapies which will help in the repair and recovery of the patient that's why you see there is a lot of rehabilitation in our case omar so this rehabilitation will help in the repairing and regeneration of the neuronal tissue in turn which will lead to the regain the loss function in the patient affected with the stroke so how does repair occur in the nervon neurons it is the restoration of the tissue architecture and function after an injury so the morphologically also the tissue should remain the similar what it was before and functionally also it will exhibit the same function what was it was doing before the injury so the repair can be two types depending upon the cell type capacity to repair and the extent of damage if the damage is very superficial there will be complete regeneration complete replacement of the tissue with the normal tissue and there won't be any loss of function okay so this is called as the regeneration okay or another way of the repair is by the connective tissue okay in non cns it is by the fibrosis in cns it is gliosis if you come you see the function is lost in case of injury and if it is getting healing by the form of fibrosis or gliosis so our focus main on the regeneration because with the regeneration the function is not lost so as i told you before the old view was that the neuronal cells are the permanent cells and they can never be regenerated but recent science has found that neuronal stem cells can form new neuron cells this may involve recovery of the brain tissue that does not working is now working again and plasticity so you know like you have got the neuronal cells recovery so you see the patient is able to gain his function after an stroke this is mainly due to the neurogenesis and the neuroplasticity so endogenous repair mechanism after stroke there will be first and foremost thing will be restoration of the neuronal network the what is has been lost the stem cell will get activated and they will produce the cell resembling to the cell which is lost both in the morphology and in the function these cells will require nutrition so there will also the restoration of the blood supply which is done by the angiogenesis so there is happening neurogenesis the architecture and the new cells and the function so there is neuroplasticity and the neurogenesis followed by angiogenesis then there is also role of phagocytic microglia which comes into there and which play important phagocytosis to take the non required material during the neurogenesis and neuroplasticity and this injured tissue is getting protected by the formation of a glial tissue so this glial tissue will act as a barrier which protect this for newly formed 
brain parenchyma. So where does this stem cells are located? These stem cells are located in the subgranular zone and subventricular zone. Whenever there is ischemic injury, this start proliferating and differentiating into the neuron cells. Okay, so neurogenesis formation of the new neuron. And this so far the neurogenesis is only seen in the olfactory bulb and the hippocampus of adult mammals. But current studies shows neurogenesis neurogenesis in the adult popul adult male population also. So what happened in the reorganization? Okay, if you have lost some function like walking and working with your hand, you will give your patient a skill training with the rehabilitation. This rehabilitation skill training will send signals to the brain to give the command to form. If suppose I flex and extend my uh, affected limb with the help of a physiotherapist, okay? So this action will send signal to the brain and brain will try to regenerate some cells which can send the signal back to the arm to perform its own, not with the help of a fish, uh, not with the helper, okay? As after neurogenesis and neuroplasticity in the regeneration of senes parenchyma, angiogenesis is a very, very important, okay? Because it provides nutrition to the developing brain parenchyma and it also like uh, will lead to the uh, taking out the free radical oxygen species and other toxic material from that area through the venous circulation, okay? So there are many factors which is involved in the angiogenesis, okay? So what are these factors? We have vascular endograde factor receptor 1, neuropylene, vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2. Then we have angiopoietin, which is Ti receptor. So these are angiogenesis. Only the VEGRF2 is involved in the angiogenesis of the repair, while the VGF R1 and neuropylene is involved in the angiogenesis of the embryonic development, while tie receptor, which is involved in the angiogenesis and the inflammation. So after neurogenesis and neuroplasticity, angiogenesis is very important. VGFR2 is required in the angiogenesis of the repair mechanism of the CNS damage. VGFR2 it is, and neuropylene, it is usually uh, like angiogenetic factor during embryonal life and tie receptor angiopoietin which is like uh, associated with the angiogenesis in the inflammation not in the neurogenesis and the neuroplasticity what do you like as we are talking about the glial scar formation okay what do you mean by glial scar formation due to the damage and the liquefactive necrosis there is like a cyst formation filled with the liquefactive material in the initial days and a fluid like material in the later days okay what happened over there the periphery zone to prevent the injury extended to the other area there is formation of the gliosis these gliosis is nothing but they comes from the astrocytes okay and this will try to form the thick network of a gliosis and the what you call is the capillary blood vessel which prevent the progression of the injury then there is role of microglia okay microglia are the microphage in the cns okay they are very very essential in the healing and repair mechanism okay so if the acro microglia is activated due to the primary activation which will lead to the acute phase and it will be a neurotoxic microglia which has to be treated with the tissue injury other one are the recovery phase okay so these microglia they will be like there is delayed activation, there is recovery phase, and there is acceptance of the father money. Oh, sorry, there is acceptance of the injury and the inflammatory material, which will lead to the recovery phase. And this recovery phase is mainly by the phagocytic microglia. While the 
in the acute phase, whenever there is a primary activation of the microglia, that will lead to the injury because these are the neurotoxic microglia. These neurotoxic microglia, what they will do, they will go at the site of injury, they will break down the myelin, break down the NGO tissue, they try to clear. So they try, they try to clear, so they act as the neurotoxic microglia. While in the recovery phase, they are mainly towards the phagocytosis, they bring repair cytokines which help into the repair like tissue growth factor or neuronal growth factor that will help into the neuronal repair with the help of neurogenesis T and the angiogenesis. So M1 type of microglia, they are usually non-phagocytic microglia. They will produce inflammatory cytokines and they are in the acute phase. While the activated phagocytic cells, M2 type are the phagocytic cells and they can be in the tissue microglia. So I know like this, the repair is little bit confusing. So for then you remember when the neuronals are the permanent cells, but they have some stem cells in the brain tissue. Are you following me? Yes. Okay, so yes. this is a brief, brief, like you have the brief of the, like what you can say about the mecha repair mechanism following a stroke. There are stem cells. These stem cells will help into the neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, okay? So far it is seen in the olfactory bulb completely and the hippo hippocampus. But as you see the patient of the stroke, they recover certain functions completely. They initially has aphasia, but they can talk completely. They have loss of hand movement, but the hand movement come back completely. Or they have loss of power to zero in the lower limb, but it can come back to the power of two. So means there is some neurogenesis, okay? And these neurogenesis is usually with the help of the stem cells, okay? And this mechanism known as the neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. And to help it, we have angiogenesis. So in the angiogenesis, you have the growth factor. Angiopiotin, usually angiogenesis in the inflammation. While vascular endothelial growth factors, type 2, usually in the repair. Type 1, usually in the Embryonic. You have the question sometimes, VG, VG, which of the angiogenesic factor responsible in the repair? So always it is VGFR2. And the glial scar formation is usually this scar formation is protective. It limits the area of damage. Okay, It forms the thick glial tissue which will help in progression of this injury. And you have the microglia. Microglia also help in the repair. There are two types of microglia. M1 microglia. M1 microglia usually in the acute phase. And they are the neurotoxic microglia. They induce tissue injury. Okay, But when the recovery phase start, they are M2 type of microglia. They are phagocytic microglia. They help in the tissue repair with the help of Grow, various growth factor and various reparative cytokines. So stroke triggers physiological and structural changes in the neuronal circuit adjacent to the infarct. These changes affect stroke recovery and can be manipulated to lead to the neuronal repair. Okay, so time is very important. Okay. So you have the neuroplasticity after stroke. There is axonal sprouting. There is regeneration of the central and peripheral nervous system so that you can regain as much as function you have lost due to the stroke. So this is our lecture. Sorry for taking time because you know like uh, the slides are more and we have a lot of like uh, things to discuss from the pathogenesis of the stroke to the repair mechanism. If you have any doubt, if you find something contradictory in the lecture or some resources you are reading, please do let me know 
so that we can correct it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Doctor. And any time if you have any difficulty, uh, my number is with the group leader as well as uh, the students of M1. You can take my number and you can approach me if you want to clarify anything. Uh, I know the last part of the lecture was a little bit boring, but we cannot help it. OK, so just go through the lecture. If you have time, just read it once. OK. OK, then okay. I will try to I will just leave the class. OK, all the best. Hello, Salam Aliko. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.